For Korea Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Wadi. Joining me today is martial artist Eddie Jardine, here to discuss his memoir, One Moment, One Lifetime. You are third generation South African born Chinese. Can you tell us a bit about your family history from your grandparents to your parents and about how your family first arrived in South Africa? Yeah, I think my grandfather arrived in South Africa and um, I think those days the turmoil in China. A lot of Chinese people left to try and find a better life in other countries. And my grandfather married a lady in, in South Africa. So his name was Liu Jiaqin. And so you might wonder why a Chinese person with a name like Jardine, you know. Uh, my surname is actually Liu. Uh, the Chinese say the surname's first and the second name's afterwards. So when they came here, he probably told them, my name is Liu Jiaqin, and they said, oh, Liu Jardine. So Jardine stuck with me, uh, with all of us ever since I got there. Now you grew up in South Africa during apartheid, and you write that South African society made you feel inferior, and that apartheid made you feel more Chinese. Can you unpack that for us? Well, I think it happens to a lot of people that are under the apartheid system. Like, for example, when you go to the bank or whatever like it, there, there's always two entrants, Blanca and Ni Blanca, you know, whites and non-whites. And to catch a train where you find like a, you're not allowed in certain sections, like to catch a bus, you got to sit behind, etc. I think all these things do make you feel inferior, you know. So uh, we, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Germiston location. I'm not too sure what it was called, maybe the Germson Asiatic Bazaar. Uh, moved to uh, Benoni, uh, Actonville, and, and those days Actonville was called the Asi Asiatic Bazaar as well. Uh, so we grew up in, under these kind of conditions though, you find like, you know, and uh, I, I think not just us though, but everybody feels a feeling of inferior, like you get an inferior complex from thinking that, uh, that you, you're not up to, you know, whatever color. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and yes, I think with everyone here too though, you know, it does bring you closer together because you come to a country and you're not, you're not accepted as a South African. And so therefore you fall back on your basic and your history, your root. And, and finally, in that kind of way though, you know, you can say, how can I be a good South African if I can't be a good Chinese? You know, that kind of thinking. So the parents always encourage the kids to study hard and be a good person. For example, there's an interesting factor with the Chinese people uh, in those days. I think eventually we, we, we ended up with the highest per capita university graduates and the lowest in crime rate. And because the parents always say, just do your best. Even people look down on you, don't think of harming them, just improve yourself. You know, and, and always from my, from my grandmother on my mother's side to, to parents, I could always just study hard and improve yourself all the time. And people accept you if you improve yourself. Where did your love for martial arts begin? Growing up in a location where uh, things were sometimes really dicey and daily kind of uh, robberies and, and always having fights, etc. like that there because of the different, different cultures and different nations being together like that, I think it's bound to happen. Uh, made, made me realize the need for looking after myself. And my dad always used to say, oh, you're a man, you must learn to look after yourself. You know, so from about five years old, uh, my dad, being a boxer and a street fighter, used to give me like a, put on a pair of gloves and we'd stand there and we'd spar, you know. So from five years old, which is like more than, well, you know, nearly 70 years ago, you know, yeah, I used to spar with my dad. And our interest began more when we, um, when we have parties and we listen to the older folks, the uncles, the grandfathers, the greatest, to talk about Chinese martial arts and it made us very interested in that because of the need for defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to learn from books because we couldn't go to schools, certain schools those days. In fact, the first time we tried to join a school, we got told that uh, they needed permission from someone to allow us to, to join the school you know, uh, because we were non-whites. And finally, we got to a school in Germiston, that uh, was a Roy Brown school in Germiston, Karate School, and he accepted us. And I'm, I'm, until today, I'm very grateful to Roy for giving us the chance as well, yeah. Um, but uh, definitely growing up in vacation, I think everybody that grows up in a kind of a poor area, you, you know, you, f you find people who become more aggressive, they can look after themselves, you got you know, this complex about life, etc. and and you need to do things to defend yourself, maybe. Mm. 
Now, in your book, you also say that no one country can take credit for the origins of martial arts. Yeah, and that's a fact because a lot of people, as soon as they think of martial arts, they think of the East, you know. Over here, look at the, the you got the Zulu stick fighting over here, you know. And I'm sure a lot of people, though, even look into their own culture, in the Zulu stick fighting realm as well, there are also a lot of laws and rules and norms as well how, on, on behavior. Because you're teaching someone something potentially dangerous, there must be the element of like working together, respect, learning together like that there. So I think if, if a lot of people look, look back into their own culture, they'll find a wealth of wisdom and knowledge in the culture. So in my case, I follow the Eastern type of master from boxing to Eastern martial arts from books and into joining a dojo. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that improves you in some way. I mean, look at everyone around here. What, what improves you? For a lot of people, making money improves you. Having a degree improves you, you know, etc. Like at the martial arts, make, made you a stronger person and maybe being a bit stronger, you become more confident, etc. And so my working in martial arts was like it uh, originally for self-defense purpose. Eventually, more than that, much more than that. It's a, it's a wealth of something. Martial arts on its own, though, you, even the word martial is written with, um, with a spear and another spear crossing it, the martial. And, and the, bottom word, the b bottom word means to stop. It means to be, to be strong enough to avoid the conflict. So martial has that kind of connotation. Whereas a lot of people, like in the West, think of martial arts from the word Mars, the god of war. It's for warlike and for fighting, etc. Whereas the actual Chinese word means to stop fighting, to be strong enough to, to, to avoid the conflict. Now, can you tell us about the two martial arts masters who changed your life? Yeah, so from self-defense, you know, after a while, for example, like you find you want to learn self-defense, you know, and a very shortcut. I just tell you, you find, pick up one of these things like it there and hit him on the head as hard as you can, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll teach you different ways of doing that, you know. After a while, you can do that. You know, what else is there in the martial arts to learn? Do we just continue hitting each other and, and we keep on escalating this kind of a conflict situation all the time? If I overcome you, I only overcome half the person. The other half will want revenge, etc. So in many ways, it creates more and more conflict. Mm. So for me, the walk with the martial arts has been an exercise to make you stronger, to be able to avoid the conflict and to be able to understand that you're going to be yourself and improve on yourself rather than improve yourself at the expense of other people. I think uh, competition is very good for when you sell a product, like, oh, Omo, or whatever like that there, but not good for people. You know, and I've always believed that people must learn to compete with themselves daily. Every time you find improving yourself daily. And the martial arts has an aspect. Every single body language in the martial arts teaches you that. When you come to the school, you, you learn to respect your partner, etc. you find, because your partner, he's not your enemy. He's someone who helps you improve, and you help him improve, or her. You know, so respect is a very big part of the martial arts. And a lot of people, they get into conflict situation all the time because there's been a loss of respect. And so, like they say, uh, the martial art begins and ends with respect for each other. So this is one of the big lessons. And a lot of people take it as a kind of a, oh, we just bow because it means I can hit the other person after I bow. No, it's not that. It's, uh, it's, it's more than respecting yourself and the other person, respecting the moment, the time we can be together. And when you bow to the par your partner, it's like saying, please, let's train together so we can learn from each other. One of the sayings that actually burnt deep in my mind in the early days was uh, the one person called Kichin Funakoshi. He introduced karate in Japan in the 1917s, I think. So karate only started in Japan in 1917, went from Okinawa, Japan. And he had a saying that the ultimate aim of the art of karate doesn't lie in victory or defeat, but in the perfection of character of its participants. So you do something, you try and improve your character, not to win or lose over another person. Your training, your body movement, etc. you find, must pertain to that as well. That's all very well saying, I will improve myself, etc. But if I compete with you, I think of beating up all the time, my movements are all always crashing with you, etc. like it there. It tends to take you away from the, from the method of maybe improving yourself. You tend to, tend to be, oh, I'm, I'm better than you. Mm. you know? Because I'm better than you, I, it doesn't mean I've improved myself. 
You know, so it's a kind of a self battle all the time. And one of the most important lessons that we learn in the mass class is that you can't hurt another person without hurting something inside within yourself too. So to harm another person, you're actually harming yourself too because we are communicating, we are, it's a whole type thing like that. We're all together, you know. And if we grow too, I help another person grow, or he helps me grow, we all grow together. And I think that's so important to think of in the martial arts, that you must help each other grow. And, and, and we are different so we can learn from each other. How did you begin teaching and what is your biggest lesson to your students? First, when I got into teaching in 1967, 68, was of course just many technique, young those days, many technique like when how to punch, how to kick, etc. You know, and eventually, like there's a saying in in, in karate too, that uh, besides a uh, uh, ray, uh, one of the first ray starting, bowing to each other's martial arts begins and ends with respect for each other's. Okay, and if you look at a lot of the even a lot of the so-called kata that the kids learn or people learn, it's forms of training like at the it starts with the bow and it starts with the with the block with the defense. So all the hidden meanings I get there it tells you that the martial arts is for self-defense, not for not for like being aggressive. You never have, have a cutter teaching you that you find you start of digging someone's eyes out or whatever like that there. It's defending yourself first. So it starts with the block. So all these lessons I think is important though. So be careful what you think. Be careful what you say, be careful what you do. I think it's all got all that kind of elements. And one of the things that I really enjoy, I think it's from the Rubaiyat, huh? it says that the moving finger writes and having writ moves on. Nor all your piety in a wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out the word of it. I think that's so important that you find that, that whatever you do, it affects you. Mm. So you've got to be always mindful of what you're doing all the time. Mm. You know, and, and when you train with a partner too, um, be mindful of how you you help each other grow instead of like creating an aggression towards each other like that there. Because aggression only creates more aggression, unfortunately. You believe in the Kung Fu Panda philosophy. Can you tell us what lessons stands out for you from the movie? Well, I thought it's really, it's really great though in a cartoon when uh, someone can say that uh, you must live in the moment, you must live in the present. It's called the present because it's a gift of love from the universe. You know, so I think it's fantastic to, to see that from a cartoon and that we must live the moment. You know, like if you look at that book like it there, it's got the saying there, Yat ke yat wo or in Japanese, Ichigo Ichie, okay, at the back of the book. Um, it means that every moment is unique and we must live life like it there. Some people just exist for a very long time. Some people have a short life but a long life. That's not for us to decide. But while you are here, live every moment as if it's your last moment. And that's a cover of the book like it there, that one moment is a lifetime, one moment, one lifetime. And try to live life like it. Then no matter what you find, if you die at 30, 40, whatever like it there, you've had a lifetime. That was Eddie Jardine discussing his memoir, One Moment, One Lifetime.